All right. Hello, everybody. Really happy to be here on stage uh, again this year. I'm Oskari, CEO of Ivan, a uh, cloud software company. Really happy to welcome Olivier uh, on stage with me. Uh, Olivier, as you heard, is the CEO and founder of Datadog. Hi. Great to be here. Yeah. So uh, I had the honor to invite Olivier to Helsinki to speak at, speak at Slush, and, and happy to have him here. A uh, little known fact about Oli, I think, in addition to being a founder and CEO of Datadog, is, is that he actually has a soft spot in his heart for, for this location, uh, you know, the site of uh, the assembly event. Uh, you know. yeah. I, I, just, I just heard this was here the, where the assembly was, was held. And when I was growing up, I was watching these demos and on my Amiga, and it looked like everybody was from Finland. And, and finally, I'm here today, so I'm living the dream. Yeah. So I also was part of, part of that community for some time. And my background is also in, in engineering, software development. And that is something that ultimately led me to start building Ivan, uh, turning open source technologies into cloud services. Uh, Oli, you want to talk a little bit about your background? Like, how did you get started with? with yeah, so I'm I'm an engineer. I mean, I, as I said earlier, I, I grew up watching demos. Then I wanted to program in 3D. Then I started programming video. I, I actually worked on the first version of VLC before some more capable people turned it into something real. Um, and and then you know, fast forward a few years, I was in the, in New York with a. Um, um, with a, a very good friend of mine, and we decided to start Datadog. I think it was in 2010. Mm. Excellent. So we were you know, uh, asked to talk about product-led growth and PLG and what that means. So you know, I think Datadog has been you know, labeled as a PLG company uh, for a long time. But like, what does PLG actually mean to you? Do yeah. you use that term anyway? Yeah. So we don't actually use the word. I hate the word. Um, I, I discourage people from using the word. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, half of your organization is not product. Uh, so if you run you know, product-led growth, then you know, what does your sales team do? Like, you know, and it gives people an idea that they don't contribute, whereas they're actually a very big part of it. Um, so, and, and by the way, this is one of the main misconceptions. Uh, product-led growth still needs sales. Uh, you still need absolutely everything else. You just use it differently, and you structure the company differently. So for us, uh, product-led growth is just growth. You know, that, mm. That's how we do things. And, and if I were to characterize it, uh, really what, what it's uh, rooted in is uh, it's putting the customer in control, putting the user in control. So we don't control what they do. Uh, we don't push to them. They pull from us. So we, they control how much they commit, how much they buy, uh, what the terms are of what they buy, how much they use. And then the whole company is articulated around uh, delivering value to them and uh, driving their usage of the product and therefore all revenue up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Like We started building Ivan as engineers to build a product and a platform that we would have loved to use, something that just allowed me, you know, myself, other people like me, to get started building something uh, using technologies that were familiar to us. We also hadn't he heard of the PLG term until, I think, actually, I first heard about it at this event here in Slush some years ago when we were between, I think, our A and B rounds. And uh, I thought, like, well, I guess that's what we're doing. That's how we got to more, like, more than $10 million in, in uh, ARR before we heard, heard of the term or, or figured out a different model for the company. Company. So, yeah, I mean, in our case, so we started very early. We, um, when uh, when we got the company started, it was it was difficult to to get it funded. Um, so we we didn't have any money, we didn't have any customers. Uh, everybody thought that what we were doing was a little bit stupid. Um, so we were very scared of not getting the problem right and doing something that was useless. And as a result, we. Uh, we made ourselves feel better by spending more time with the customer and making sure we really understood their problem and making sure we really solved the problem for them. Mm. Uh, and I think that's what rooted all of our you know, journey through, uh, through product-led growth. You know, we started by having the founding team spend uh, a ton of time with customers. Uh, then we made the first deals ourselves with customers. Then because we didn't have the money or the prestige to attract uh, great salespeople, we didn't hire any salespeople, so we, some, we did some more of the sales ourselves. Um, and that's where I would say the, the whole uh, motion you know, got in place with the company. Then we scaled that. Then, of course, we added the sales motion behind it. Then we got through all of the other steps. Yeah. But we, we didn't do it by choice. You know, we didn't read a blog post about you know, PLG and said, that's what we need to do. Uh, we, uh, 
we, we did it because we didn't have any choice. Yeah. I think that's very, very uh, relatable to me uh, as you know, founding Ivan. I was going to ask you when you mentioned, like, you know, this is what you, know, you did. So just like specifically, who did you mean in the company? Who was working with the customers? Um, so, well, the whole founding team was, you know. Yeah. But very importantly, what we had very early on is uh, a product team and a and product leadership that wanted to spend time with customers and that was not afraid of discussing value and money with customers. So basically, the first deals were made by our, our product team. And still today, for newer products, a lot of the deals are made by the product team. And what this gives us is uh, a product team that intrinsically understands the value, understands what parts of the product are good enough or not good enough, because they understand what customers are going to pay for or they're not going to pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, this is a mistake I make, I see many uh, new entrepreneurs make, which is that they raise money, um, it looks like they're going to be successful, they get experienced investors on board, and the first thing the experienced investors help them do is hire an experienced sales leader. And then what they do with the experienced sales leader is that they start building a sales force right away. Mm -hmm. And they don't get the occasion to develop that strong culture of having their product team interact with the customer. Mm -hmm. And very often, founders are like doing that because they don't actually know, know how to or like to have uh, conversations with their customers about value. Mm. They love talking about product, but they don't love talking about value. So my, my advice to anybody who wants to go that route is to make sure that very early on, on the team, you have some people in the product organization who are not, a, first, who enjoy spending most of their time with customers, because that's where the value is, but also who are not afraid to discuss what's valuable, what's not, and to make deals with the very, the very first few customers. Yeah. Is there a concrete example of, of a case where you know, you've failed at identifying, like, is something you're building actually valuable to the customers early? Uh, it happens very often. Actually, it's something that happens more often now, because we are, so you know, for the first, uh, the first half of the company, the first six years, we, wa we had one product, and we found great product market fit early on, and then we spent our time adding to that and scaling the company around it. You know, up to, I, just, I think at, after those six years, we were around 100 million in AR, something like that. Um, after that, though, we started building more product, building out our platform, um, adding more to, uh, to what we were selling to our customers. And as we did that, we needed to pivot from having one thing that works really, really well to having a lot more things. Um, some of them are not going to work really well from day one. Mm. Uh, and so we had all the issues that companies have where they go from a position of safety, you know, which is, I, you know, I know what I'm doing, uh, I have validation of it, uh, my customers love it, to a position where we come up with things that may be great you know, right mm. out of the gate, or maybe not. And oftentimes, they're not fantastic right out of the gate. I mean, oftentimes, there's good parts about them, and there's, uh, there's not so good parts. And it's a, a bit of a shift or pivot in culture at that time to get your product team to want to see the bad news, to actually want to go talk to the customers, hear what's not working, hear what's missing, uh, listen to it, you know, because usually we were discussing mm -hmm. this that right before, but your customers love you, uh, and they are typically good human beings. So they don't want to upset your feelings. So when you go to them with a new product, they'll say, yes, I'll use it. Um, they tell you great things. Um, and when they give you feedback about what they really don't like about it or what's missing, they try to you know, wrap it into compliments, like that, uh, that's the proverbial cheese sandwich. Um, and most people uh, don't want to look at the bad part. Like they mm. just listen to the good parts and say, yes, they love it. Whereas the only part that matters, the only part people really meant was the part that's broken or missing. Mm. And we, not today, for all of the new products, we typically see that when we go from the first phase of every, pro every product is working with design partners. And then after that, we start asking those design partners for money. We start charging for the mm. product. When we do that is when the bad news comes. That's when we figure out what's missing. Yeah. Um, and it's very important for us as a part of our process and culture to, um, to make sure people, everybody on you know, the product, product side is comfortable with that. So you, you know, scale the company from you know, you had, you know, two or three founders. Maybe you know, that's another, another interesting topic on like, how did you get you know, scale the company early on. But especially with scale, you're you know, bringing in new people, and they mm -hmm. have to be educated on, on what actually is value creating for your, you know, your end users, your customers. So how do you find the right types of people who get what you're doing, or do you train them to do, 
get well, it? So first of all, we train most of the, the people on the sales team. Uh, most people are, I mean, some people are familiar with our space, but not completely. Um, and most, uh, especially most experienced uh, salespeople, uh, are not, exp are not uh, used to selling um, in, in a, I hate the word, but product-led environment, mm. uh, which means that they're going to have customers in charge. Uh, customers are going to accrue usage over time. And they are not going to sell very large commits up front. Like customers are not going to start from day one spending millions of dollars and committing for five years, um, yeah. which is a, whole, a lot of the software sales were made historically. So one of the big things we do is when people join, we retrain train them so that they expect to, uh, to do smaller transactions, faster transactions, and then grow uh, their business with customers by driving their usage up, by making sure basically customers know where the value is, know where to find it, and, and get that, that usage themselves. I think it's great because I think it, uh, again, it keeps the customer in charge. Mm. Um, and, and by the way, you have to be willing to live with the consequences of that, you know, which is um, you push customers to do month-to-month -month deals and to uh, commit at their level and uh, grow as they see, uh, as they see fit, uh, which means you're not protected. Like if something goes wrong, if they're not happy, if you don't deliver the value, you'll have the bad news right away. But I think it's, uh, it's good because it forces you to get all the news, mm. good or bad, very quickly. And it also uh, forces the, uh, the whole sales organization to think long-term. They think not in terms of what deal can I close today with this customer, but rather what is that customer going to look like for me a year or two years from now, and how do I make them successful, which I think aligns everyone. Yeah, so over the years, you've shown the success of this model scaling to you know, where you are today, uh, at more than a billion in, in revenue. But early on, was it easy for you to also explain the model that you're operating under to your investors uh, that you know, well, maybe you know, we're more used to some, some more traditional enterprise sales? Well, I think initially the, the biggest challenge was not with the investors um, who were fairly comfortable with the model. Um, I think the model was, the problem was more with the, uh, the employee pool or the talent pool for sales. Mm. Uh, because it's fairly new. I think today it's becoming more common, but you know, five, six years ago, uh, it was more difficult to find people who were open to the idea um, and who didn't see that as a, uh, you know, uh, as a step down you know, in their career. Like, it's very important. Part of it is how people understand their own success and how, what their expectation is, is of, of how they're going to be successful. When your whole experience has been closing million dollar deals, um, and when on your first day you're asked to close a $50,000 deal, um, it's a big shift. Yep. And, and I think it, it, uh, today it's easier. But it took some time initially to make sure people understood that they were going to be even more successful, just, just in a different way. Yeah. So we've definitely seen that as, at Ivan, uh, understanding how we can uh, also scale up our sales teams and, and educate them on the model that we are using. As you say, it's now more and more common, but I think still today, the consumption models that we're operating under are not really the standard in, in most businesses. So. When it comes to you know, being, you know, running a public company and you have tons of customers that are on this kind of a model, like, what does that mean to you? Like, uh, well, I think f as a public company, it's fine, I think, because the, uh, what we do, which is like what you do, like, you, know, you sell uh, databases as a service. Yeah. Uh, we sell you know, uh, observability and security for infrastructure. All of that is inherently recurring. Like mm -hmm. the workloads are there. They're not disappearing. Uh, it's not transactional. Um, so from a business perspective, it's, a, it's still a subscription model uh, that is fairly safe. I think the one thing that you, you do lose in the equation, though, is you cannot really fully predict growth in the very short term, mm. like, because it's all depending, depending on the customer usage. Um, and I think, it, again, I think in the end it's good. It makes us stronger, because we get the, the bad news earlier, or the good news often. I mean, when, mm. when customers scale up, uh, they don't have to talk to us. Uh, they, if they find more value and they use more product, you don't have to talk to us. It's a very efficient model. Um, but I think you do lose a little bit of short-term predict predictability there. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely what we see as, as well. We're just looking at our top customers and, and in aggregate, we got our forecasts pretty well right, but individually, customer by customer, it was a completely different picture for, for all of them. So I guess with enough data, you, you start to see the big picture and the trends trends there. Yes, well, it's especially interesting, like in the, 
we, we've had uh, an interesting period through COVID and another one now with you know, what looked like maybe uh, some economic disturbances. Um, it's very interesting to see you know, what happens to the usage pattern of customers. And you know, it's also something that we communicate to our, to our investors a lot like, to make sure they understand what we see and what the, uh, what the reality of the business is. Mm -hmm. So going back a little bit to the product topic. So you, know, you started basically with one product, and mm -hmm. then you evolved it uh, to bring in more capabilities. Some you, know, grew, you grew organically, and others you uh, brought in through acquisitions. Can you describe a little bit of you know, your thinking about expanding from one product to? Yeah, so, so for us, what we built, it was always meant to be a platform that brought together different teams and different use cases. So and the, the infrastructure monitoring was the, the first use case. Um, we didn't even want to call the product infrastructure monitoring initially. We just did it because you know, a, a data platform to bring DevOps together. You know, everybody loved the idea, but nobody understood what that was. Um, so it was much easier to find product market fit this way. But we always intended to build more on that platform and bring more use cases and, and unify what used to be different parts of a, of a larger observability category. Um, we also specifically, we thought that if we wanted to grow the company for a very long time, we needed to be able to have more than one product. Mm. And so for us, really uh, getting from one to multiple products was the, the threshold to cross so that we'd feel comfortable taking the company public and basically making a commitment to investors to grow it for a very long time. Um, we, so we started on that in uh, 2016, 2017, and we got to the proof points we wanted by 2019, which is when we took the company public. Mm. The, the biggest challenges there were to, uh, to operate the core trans transformations I talked about before, which were how do, we, how do we turn our team that is mostly succeeding into a team that is going to start by failing before they succeed? How do we make it attractive for the members of the team? You know, how do we con convince uh, someone who's working on a team that knows exactly what they're doing, uh, that has all these customers putting for more? to actually go into a place that's unknown where they might fail initially. Like, mm. it actually takes uh, a little bit of transformation initially for that. Yeah. But we also didn't lose the coordinates of the company. We kept, for all of our new products, we kept everything uh, uh, customer-driven in terms of, uh, of usage. So basically, none, none, of every, none of the new products we shipped had to be big commitments up front. Everything was consumed as it went and as it delivered value to customers, and we made sure the customers had all the levers to control that. Yeah. So when you add more capabilities, you add more products. I suppose it can be a bit discouraging at first because you don't see the great take up of the new products that you saw with the existing popular ones. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, initially you see everything that's broken, everything that's missing. Yeah. You're picking up new competitors. Um, and your competitors you know, uh, make it clear to, the, to, to your customers that you're still missing some features. You know, so it's a, it, it's a race, yes. Yeah. But you know, the good news is once you've done it a few times, you, you grow confidence that you, know, you can actually catch up, you can exceed the competition. Uh, you need to understand how do you deliver value to some customers first. Like, you know, products typically start by being super useful to a narrow band of customers. Mm -hmm. And then as, you, as the products mature, they can be useful to a much broader and broader band of customers until they reach the full market. Yeah. And we, we've practiced that playbook now. Did you have to make a lot of changes to your team as you went from you know, one product to more products and uh, like how you're talking about Datadog and what does Datadog mean to, to end customers? We, we did. So we, you know, we had to invest quite a bit on the, on the go-to-market side in enablement, making sure everybody understood how everything fit together. We also had to really defend the way we run product um, so that the product management team wouldn't get isolated from the customer and would still keep that culture of spending the half of their time you know, with customers in the customer's shoes and really understood the value of their business. Mm -hmm. So we, I would say you know, it took a few trials and errors uh, to do that. I mean, from the outside, it looks like a beautiful you know, um, exponential growth. You know, from the inside, we broke a lot of things very often and we fixed them. Mm -hmm. uh, even at the organizational level. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a learning process, yes. Yeah. So kind of talking about like scaling up the, and changing the go-to-market uh, team, a uh, big part of your go-to-market team was always, I suppose, reporting to your chief product officer of the, of the company. How did that come about? So, the, well, actually, it's rooted in the, what we did by leading with customer growth or customer usage. The, one year into the, the life of the company, we hired the uh, head of product. 
who is really like the third co-founder of the company. Um, and he was the one who was spending most of his time trying to make deal with customers and ended up r running the early iterations of the, of the sales team before we, we hired professional sales leadership to do that. Uh, and by the way, that's another piece of advice. Again, if you have the occasion, uh, if you are uh, running a product-led uh, growth company, um, even though you shouldn't call it this way, uh, I really encourage you to start by running sales from product and only try to hire specialized sales after that. Uh, one reason, as I mentioned earlier, is that you build a better culture in product and you understand your customer problem better. Uh, another reason is that, at least for us, uh, when you're a small startup, um, it's hard to attract the very best mm. uh, sales leaders. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of engineers. Like when you start from scratch, you get the best engineers because they want to shape everything, uh, build everything from zero, and yeah. uh, make it their thing. Uh, for sales, it's the opposite. For sales, uh, you tend to, to recruit and attract the very best people when you have some scale and um, something that can be accelerated, something that has a high likelihood of being very, very, very successful if it's managed right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes makes sense, and that's uh, definitely something we've seen seen at Ivan. And uh, candidly, we tried to scale up sales too early, and uh, it didn't really work out. So we ended up scaling the company just uh, by creating better products and, and talking to our customers, and and that's how we got to got to the scale of like 10 million, as I as I mentioned before. And so, by the way, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an investor in Ivan. It's it's been, it's been fun to see <laughs> to see it grow. Yeah, really happy to have, have you yeah. on the. On I the hope team. you're going back to work after that, by the way. Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, talking about the company, so, you know, we both started building products for people that, you know, like ourselves, people that we thought, you know, we would appreciate what we we're building. But now, another, I think, important part about, about building compa companies and products is like, so what, you know, what's the identity? Like, who are you and what do you look like and, and all that? So. Yeah, and I see you have a you have a crab. By the way, the first time I saw that, I was wondering what it was about. You know, I was wondering if it was a Finnish thing. You know, but yeah, it's. I mean, uh, so uh, Ivan's identified by a crab, and some people have asked me if it's a seafood business. Uh, that's not not quite the case, but we appreciate seafood, and we do have uh, you know company traditions of crayfish parties, which is a a uh, great Nordic tradition. But uh, you know, identity has, is, is really a big part of the company, and uh, we figured out what we want to do much earlier than we figured out how do we actually want to look like. We wanted to have a kind of a fresh look, look uh, for Ivan. Uh, we have four founders at Ivan, and, and we had some debate around should we look like a letter A or should we look like a crab? And uh, you know, we had uh, some different opinions between the founders, so I asked my, my then uh, three-year-old daughter to, to tell us what we should, should be, and uh, she selected the crab, and that's, that's how we've always been, been uh, you know, working with crabs. But like, so what about the, you know, the dog, the yeah. data dog? Like, so, what's the dog? So at least, you know, you don't get the question, always get the question, um, do you like dogs, or do you have a pet dog? And you probably don't get that with a crab, but um, the, um, and the, the sad well. answer, I'm, I'm going to break all the, uh, all the myth here, but I don't have a dog. My co-founder doesn't have a dog. Um, we called the company Datadog initially. It was a code name because in our previous company, the biggest driver of pain in operation was a very large Oracle database. Um, and we called the you know, production machine machines dogs, and Datadogs were the production databases. And Datadog 17 was a database we lived uh, in fear of. You know, if it went down, everything went down. Uh, so it was the name of pain for us. It turns out everybody loved the name, like the people remembered Datadog. So we, we dropped the 17 so it wouldn't look like a MySpace handle. Um, <laughs> and then we, we looked for a logo for it. And we had mm. a, one of the first employees was a designer yeah. um, who also followed us from our previous company. And he produced a whole list of dogs. And most of them were you know, attack dogs, alpha dogs, dogs with sharp teeth and you know, small eyes, and like things that, that spell like performance, technology, you know, the future, etc. cetera. Um, and then there was a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody said, I want the puppy. Yeah. So, and I think in the end, that it ended up being the, maybe the smartest choice we've done at the time, which was something that can be identified mm -hmm. and that also represents the fact that we're here to make life easier, mm -hmm. not to be you know, another problem, something scary for our customers. Yeah. Well, I think you've succeeded very well on, on that. And you know, everybody, I think, you know, loves the dog. So 
Thank you for sharing oh, your thank story. You. It was great. Thank you. All right. Excellent.